Would you give a warm Center Street welcome to my friend Lloyd Senenko? Lloyd, you uh, are the president and founder and chief executive of HART, H-A-R-T, Humanitarian Aid. Response team. Response teams. And uh, I'm really glad you're here, Lloyd, because I'm concerned. It just feels that in this modern world, Ukraine has fallen off the map, right, with all that's going on. Mm -hmm. The war has been going on for two, almost two years, and uh, we might call it Ukraine fatigue. And I'm very anxious that that doesn't happen, and so that's why we're, uh, we're thrilled to have you. Why don't we begin, Lloyd, by just telling us what's going on right now um, in Ukraine? Yeah. Thanks, Warren. You know, it's, it is so difficult to put into adequate words how awful this war is. It's barbaric, it's cruel, uh, over 10, 000, tens of thousands of people have been killed already. Uh, cities have been completely destroyed and millions of families have been forced to become refugees in their own country. Um, living in Ukraine, we hear from our pastor partners out there that it's, it's, like, it's like a lottery. You don't know if today's going to be your last day because they know that the Russians can bomb, send a bomb anytime, anywhere, and so they live under that. Just think about all the mental health issues, especially amongst children that have to live in that kind of an environment with air raid sirens and all of this stuff going on. So it's, it's, uh, it's an awful place to be right now in the middle of this war, and, and the scope of this humanitarian disaster is phenomenal. Think about this. The United Nations says between 12 and 14 million people have had to leave their homes, escape, and flee to Western Ukraine or Europe or Canada, the U.S., etc. 12 to 14 million people. Just to put that in perspective, that is the equivalent amount of the population of British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Can you imagine all of us having to exit into Ontario, and it's not a question of calling up a moving company and saying, I'd like to move. No, the bombs are falling, and you've got minutes to get your kids and family in a car, and you exit and you leave your house and everything you own behind. It just gives you a sense of how incredible this thing is. And so this war has shattered millions of lives, millions uh, and millions. Lloyd, that, that, that's, uh, it's heartbreaking, just heartbreaking. Um, but I want to ask you, what, what is God doing? Um, we know what the enemy is doing, but what is God doing uh, in Ukraine? That's the, that's the good part, because God is building his church and extending his kingdom through this war. And remarkably, we have an opportunity to be a part of that because we have a network of churches right across the country, uh, partner churches. Center Street's got a whole bunch of partners in, in Ukraine as well. And as we resource these churches, they are now able to go into their communities and be Christ's hands and feet in their own communities. Lloyd, Lloyd, I just want to interrupt you for a second because I've traveled with you to Ukraine many times. I've always been touched by the Ukrainian Christians, how serious they are, how committed they are, how loving they are to, for, for, towards their own people. They, 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 it, we used to go to Ukraine to try to help them, and I discovered <laughs> we needed them much Absolutely. more than they needed us, and they, they would breathe spiritual life into us, and they're doing that over Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah. You see, the... Faith is the fuel of hope, and these evangelical Christians amongst all the churches there are going into their communities with that hope, and they're ministering to people that are hurting. Now, they're living in that very same war, and they're experiencing the same death and destruction, but they are taking God's hope to these people. And you know what the result is? We have record numbers of people coming to Christ in repentance and faith. We have record numbers of baptisms. It's unbelievable what's going on. I have a friend who has a ministry to Russian POWs, prisoners of war. He said recently they have over a hundred of these Russian soldiers have become Christians in the last while. Oh, that's, uh, that's yeah, applause, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just seems in this world of ours, wherever there's op opposition, there's always opportunity. Opportunity. And you know what? That's one of the things we've learned about this tragedy is I've never been involved in a war like this before, but we're, we're, we're living this every day. We have a front row seat to what's going on through all of our people in Ukraine that we're partnered with. And one of the things we've learned is that 
when there's tragedy, God has an opportunity yeah. to show His love and bring comfort and bring healing to people that are hurting. And it's the evangelical churches that are going into their communities and doing that. We are supposed to do that. That's our job. God has given us opportunities to impact all kinds of people around us. In Ukraine, this is what they're doing. But they need resources, and we cannot, pray. We let, cannot have this war fatigue. Let's, let's talk about that. You know, yeah. What can we do? Um, I, I see you wear a, a beautiful uh, Ukrainian-Canadian pin. I just, I just love that. Uh, what can we in Canada, and what can we as a church do for, uh, for Ukraine? Yeah. And this is what our brothers and sisters in Christ would ask us, because we, we've heard this from them. Number one, one of the things that we've been doing in Ukraine is we hold pastor retreats. These pastors and their wives have been working 24 hours for the last 20 months, 24 hours a day. It's unbelievable. Everyone is exhausted but exhilarated because they see what God is doing. So we have these three-day conferences or retreats, and it's just an absolute wonderful time for them. They fellowship with pastors from other parts of the country, and they share stories and encourage each other, and it's just a blessed time for them. But, and I have a, the, the honor uh, of being able to zoom into these. And a couple of weeks ago, we zoomed into one, and the fellow sitting right up front was a young pastor. His name is Andre Kornichuk. He's one of the leading young pastors in the country. He's also been to this stage. He also sp has spoken to, to us here a couple of times. Pastor Henry has been at his home in Ukraine. And so he's sitting up front, and I said to Andre, I have an opportunity to speak to Center Street. What do you want me to tell them? And Pastor Henry, he had this big smile on his face, and he said, first of all, just pray for us. Pray for our churches, pray for Ukraine, and pray for victory. Pray for victory. The second thing we can do, and this is what they tell us, is that we can be the answer to someone's prayer. You can be the answer to someone's prayer. I'll give you an example. There are hundreds and hundreds of Christian ladies whose husbands have gone to the war and they've been killed. Now they have this daunting task of raising their kids by themselves. And you know, a lot of those girls are going in, you know, they're attending churches that are partnered with Heart and our child sponsor program. The prayer on their lips right now and on their heart is if we can find some sponsors to sponsor one or two of our kids, that would be a huge help. Yeah. You can be the answer to that prayer. The other one, of course, is all the churches are saying we need more resources so we can impact our communities for Christ. So that's the other prayer is that we need to be able to help our brothers and sisters in Christ with resources for them. Those are the two major areas, yeah. pray yeah. and resources. Lloyd, thank you. Now, immediately following the service, you're going to be uh, at the back by the water wall. So if you'd like to be involved in sponsoring the children, I cannot believe what's happening to Palestinian, Jewish, Ukrainian, Russian yeah. children in this world. We've got to do something for the children. Yes. So you'll be available yes, there. absolutely. And I'm just going to say a quick word of prayer. But thank you for putting this back on the radar, right, because... Um, it's so very important. Yes. Let me say a prayer for you. Yeah. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you are doing in Ukraine, that whenever things seem so broken and so difficult, I pray that you will help the church be the church. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will fill the Christians over there with courage and with power and fill them with the Holy Spirit so that they can reach their country and save lives and encourage and bring hope to a desperate situation. Thank you so much for our brother Lloyd and for his good work and for his words to us this morning. Help us not to forget them, for we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. God bless. What's the greatest need of the people we serve, John? I would say the greatest need for the people that we serve is about connection. The biggest challenge is the war. Thousands and thousands of dead. The vast number of people in Southeast Asia are desperately seeking peace and spiritual fulfillment in life, primarily due to the emotional turmoil left behind by COVID. Here in Laval, Quebec, a lot of people uh, here were hurt by religion, uh, Christianity in the past, and right now people are not 
very open when you talk about Jesus or you talk about faith because uh, there was so much abuse in the past. People are trying to leave the nation because of the situation. Also, after COVID-19, medicine, there's no way to find medicine. People are really hungry. We know people that they eat once a day. Uh, the war has changed uh, many things in the, in the church ministry. Uh, we met the need of people who ran from the war and lost everything. Uh, many people come to the church for help and spiritual and uh, mental support. Part of addiction is all about isolation and the, the, the destruction of an emotional person, the spiritual person and physical person. And so the real need to connect to community, to the fellowship, to each other, and ultimately a connection with God. In our community, the biggest uh, cultural challenge is the rejection of the Christian faith in our society. God put in my heart to outreach 100,000 Arabic speakers. Those people are mostly refugees. They lost their countries, their families, their community, and they are in need to feel the love of Jesus. The greatest challenge is to supply the burgeoning church planting movement with enough Bibles and trained evangelists or church planters to meet the endless requests. This past year, with Center Street's assistance, Empower was able to place over 400,000 Bibles, 300,000 discipleship manuals, and launch more than 10,000 evangelists into ministry. There's been very little systemic change since the end of apartheid. And because of those things, I think many people feel discouraged, feel like there's a lack of hope and a lack of security. But into that context, we as a church get to preach the good news about Jesus Christ. At Neighbors Church, we've been baptizing people every month as new people have come into the church and found Jesus to be the one that they want to follow in their everyday lives. Thank you so much for standing with us. We are constantly in pain. We are often tired, but we see how much God working here. Because of you, there are a lot of people are eating. Because of you, a lot of people are being blessed. Because of you, the gospel is impacting the nation. And we want to thank our brothers and sisters in Canada for being such a huge blessing for this beautiful nation that we have. We have the hope of the gospel. We have the hope of a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. We have the hope of a gospel that doesn't just change your eternal address. It doesn't just change your eternal trajectory, but it changes your life. It changes your relationships now here on earth. Well, on this global mission weekend, I want to welcome all of you joining us from our Airdrie campus, uh, Bearspaw campus, Bridgeland and South campus as well. We have a very, very uh, special guest speaker here this morning, and uh, her name is Shayla Visser, and she is a friend of Center Street Church for over a decade, and uh, she's the National Director of Alpha Canada. She's the Global Senior Vice President for Alpha International. She's the executive producer of a number of Alpha film series. She has a heart for sharing her faith. And she does this so well, and at every opportunity she has, um, she is passionate about the local church and about Alpha serving the local church. And she as well um, is passionate about the church across Canada. And to see churches just rise up and share the faith, the, 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 the gospel, in just relevant ways. And so, Shayla, thank you for being here. Give Shayla a warm welcome. Thank you, Kent. Hello, everyone. And... Uh, I would just love to pray for Shayla and pray for us right in this moment. So, God, thank you for Shayla, for her passion for evangelism, sharing the gospel. Thank you for the position that you have her in, seeing across the nation and truly around the world of what you are up to, God, in the life of local churches. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear. Give us minds to understand hearts to perceive, and the courage to respond to what you want to say to us this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you. I am here from rainy Vancouver. It's wonderful to be in Calgary with all of you. I'm going to take you back to March 2020, slightly traumatic, April 2020. The pioneer behind Alpha 
Nikki Gumbel, the former vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton in central London in the UK, was saying on webinars and on podcasts and to us as staff, he was saying that this is the greatest evangelistic opportunity of his lifetime. And I remember thinking all through 2020 and coming into 2021, Lord, what about Canada? We hear stories, don't we, from overseas where so many people are coming to faith. We hear about it in Arab cultures where people have dreams about Jesus. We hear about uh, stories in, the, in Asia where people are just coming to faith in such massive numbers. And I was looking across our country and my role and thinking, Lord, do it in our day. May I live to see this in my lifetime, Lord, in our nation. Because what Nikki was saying about the UK was not readily observable in our country. And so we started praying as a staff and joining prayers, I'm sure, of people right across the country. And then in the last year and a half, I started to see a change. I've started to see what I call green shoots appearing. They're green shoots of the Lord doing new work, increasing hunger, increasing dissatisfaction in people that don't yet know Jesus, and increasing the passion in the local church to help people meet Christ. And that has been so exciting to me. As I look for these green shoots, the Lord used one particular story to really encourage me. I was in church, this is about a year ago, and I'm sitting down at the back because I'm ushering that Sunday. And my lead pastor, who wasn't preaching that Sunday, came and sidled up beside me and sat down. And he said, do you see that young man over there? Tall, blonde guy, Caucasian. I'm like, yeah, I see him. And he said, it's his first Sunday in church. I'm like, amazing. That's wonderful. And he said, but you got to hear the story. Two weeks ago, he had a dream about Jesus, and he woke up in the night having this dream. He then woke up in the morning and said, I've got to read a Bible. Like, where am I going to learn about Jesus that I just dreamed about? So he went to Indigo Chapters and bought a Bible. And he started reading at the most sensible place, page one. He starts in Genesis and he's like, I can't find Jesus. I don't know how to read this. Googles again. And he sees, oh, I should start reading at, the, at this chapter called Matthew. And he starts reading Matthew and he can't make sense of it either. And so then he Googles one last time, church near me, and finds my church. And that was his first Sunday. Two weeks later, I see him in church raising his hands to worship Jesus. I'm like, what on earth is going on? And then just a few weeks ago, uh, he was baptized. And I look at that. Yeah, amazing. But I think the Lord used it in my life to say, Shayla, as you've been praying and looking out across our nation and you're seeing these green shoots, I want you to know I'm at work like you haven't seen in our nation. And so that story encouraged me. And so we on our Alpha Canada staff began to look around and say, what else is the Lord doing? And we were hearing stories in prisons of men and women who couldn't have chaplaincy services during the pandemic from visitors coming in and churches like yours, people like you going into these places to share Jesus, to disciple people. And yet God was still at work, reaching people through the power of the Holy Spirit into prisons. We hear about Alpha running on university and college campuses and we hear students are hungry. Students that are studying at a great academic level are saying there's got to be more to life than this. So I have good news for you and for me. God is already at work in our nation. He's at work in your neighborhood and in your family and in Calgary and in Alberta and all across our country. And our job is to join him and open up the space around us and them so that they can come and meet Jesus. But we do need to change our approach, and here's why. I think we've forgotten what the Bible says. It means to be active in evangelism. So may I reframe it for you? My good friend, pastor, and theologian, Daryl Johnson says, evangelism is joining a conversation the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. And here's a passage that backs it up. Jesus says in John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, but when the advocate comes talking about the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will also testify about me because you've been with me from the beginning. 
So let me say Daryl's quote again for you. Evangelism is joining a conversation the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. Is that not good news? Is that not great news for us? We are joining the work he's already doing. And in fact, it's a great mystery that the whole Holy Spirit who loves people is already having a conversation with those people you love. As you are sitting here in church today or watching online or at one of the campuses, those people that you've been praying for, your neighbors, your work colleagues, your friends, your family, the Holy Spirit is at work. You can have confidence that he is wooing them to Jesus because that's what he loves to do. He's active in their lives. And in John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I'm like, Really, Jesus, was it good that you went away? There's many days I'd really like to walk beside him, have a meal with him, and talk to him. But he says, actually, it's good that he's gone away because the Holy Spirit comes when he goes away. And he says, if I do leave, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove or convince the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So Jesus calls us to bear witness to him. Yes, but Jesus is telling us the spirit bears his own witness to Jesus. And yes, he does it through our witness, but he does it before we come to witness. And here is the key, he does it even without our witness. The mystery is that he does not need us, but he chooses us. He calls us into the greatest work we could ever be involved with, which is helping another person meet Jesus. And it is such a joy to join him in what he's doing. And you may be here this morning feeling a bit hopeless, about some of the people you love, some of the people that their heart is nuts to crack. You're like, it is so unlikely they will ever come to faith in Jesus. Shaylee, you don't know my family member. You don't know my friend. You don't know my neighbor or my work colleague that I have been praying for for years. Let me remind you of a great and wondrous mystery. The Holy Spirit is already having a conversation with them. You can take hope in that. Your family, the people you see in the gym, the Holy Spirit is glorifying Jesus all around them and wants even more than you do that they would come to faith in him. God is talking to them. And we have to reorient ourselves to this regularly, don't we? We have to remind ourselves, you're not the initiator. The Holy Spirit is. The Father and Son are initiating with every single human. And it's liberating for us, isn't it? You do not have to worry that you are the first person into the conversation, and if you botch it, what will happen? Have you ever felt like me that you've left a conversation with someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, you've tried to be a faithful witness, and you've been like, if only I'd said, or I wish I'd taken that apologetics course, I would have been more prepared for this conversation. Oh, if only I knew how to defend or debate or say this or say that, Lord, why can't I be a better witness than I am? And I think this story may help you. You may recall that when little kids play the piano, it sounds like plink, plonk, plink, plonk, and it kind of hurts the ears a little bit because they're not very good. And they usually play notes that clash with each other, and, and that's what you hear. And when a kid's learning to play the piano, oftentimes someone will come beside them, like a parent, who knows how to play the piano, or their piano teacher, and they come around them, and you've probably seen this happen, and they come around and they wrap their arms around the child and they start to play around them. And all of a sudden, the music sounds beautiful. And all of a sudden, there's an actual song there. And those plink plonks make sense into the music of a master piano player. That's what the Lord is doing for us. On those days where you feel like, I didn't say the right thing, I could have said it better. I didn't know how to say this about Jesus and the gospel. The Lord is coming with his arms around you and he's playing all the beautiful notes to make it perfect for the person that needed to hear that. So the Holy Spirit is the initiator and he's making sense of your words so that the other person may hear the good news of Jesus. So what is our job? Our job is, as Jeremiah chapter 5 said, is to have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is doing in our world. 
So do you have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying? The Holy Spirit is radically Jesus-centric. He's doing the work of evangelization all around us, and the joy is that we get to enter into this conversation. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think about sharing my faith with other people, I often do a self-edit. Tell me if you've done this. You know if you're going to invite someone to a come and see service, or you're going to invite someone to one of the many Christmases services here, or Alpha starting in January, you think in your mind, I won't invite these people, they're the least likely to say yes. And then you think, but these people, okay, there's a stronger chance they'll say yes. Anybody else with me? You've done that before? So here's what happened in the spring of 2021. I decided I'm going to run Alpha Online with some of my university friends and other people I know across the country. First time I can run Alpha for them uh, with me as the host. And so I'm thinking about, okay, who are the most likely to say yes? And I call them and I say, could you come? Would you come? Are you interested? No. No. So I go to the next person. Are you interested? No. By the third person, I'm like, I don't feel like calling. I'm just going to text. It feels a little less bad to be rejected when you text versus having a phone call with someone. So I texted this person and they text back, thank you very much, but no, this is not of interest to me. I'm like, jeepers, Lord, what is going on? And then the Holy Spirit whispered to me, would you like to ask me who I think you should invite? So I said, okay, fine, smarter than me, much smarter than me. And I asked the Lord, and I said, would you give me a name and a picture, and I will call every single person. And don't you know, the first person he tells me to call and invite is the hardest person I could ever invite. Like, they are the least likely to come, the least likely to ever want to go on something like Alpha, no interest whatsoever in our entire friendship of having a spiritual conversation. And I invite her, and she says, what took you so long to invite me? Right? Because when we listen to the Holy Spirit, when we have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, we join Him. He knows who's ready for an invitation. And it doesn't matter if we keep getting no, we can be faithful to invite many times. A good friend of mine, originally from Calgary, who lives in Vancouver, invited his work colleague 14 times. And on the 14th time she said yes, she said, just so you'll stop inviting me. <laughs> and yet she came. She came to church, she came to Alpha, she came to faith in Jesus, and she absolutely loved it. So God is on the move. We just need to listen to him and join him in what he's doing. And so I want to ask you this question. Do you have joy in your evangelism? Joy that God is already at work. Joy that this is the best news in the world. Joy that you have found life and hope and mercy and assurance and grace and wholeness. Don't you want this for the entire world? So something is already going on. The Holy Spirit is at work, and this understanding removes fear. It removes anxiety. It removes arrogance. It removes judgment. Don't you want to be part of it? And this is an invitation to a great unveiling. Now, you've been studying the book of Revelation here at this church, and you know that when you use the word apocalypse, it does not mean what the Hollywood movies say, right? It means unveiling. And what I think is happening in our nation right now is God is unveiling the realities of this world, the realities of Jesus and who he is to a population that has no clue anything about him. He is making that veil thinner and thinner in our day so that many more people will come to know Jesus. We've seen this as so many students, I call them resilient disciples in high school, are running Alpha for their friends. We call it student-led Alpha. But do you know 125 student-led Alphas are running in high schools across our nation? Do you know what it takes for a 13, 14, 15-year-old to stand out from the crowd and say, I'm going to invite my friends to Alpha, serve pizza at lunch or after school, and share my faith through running Alpha? It's unbelievable. I wouldn't have done it in high school. And I just look at these young people and I think we need to be praying for them. And so God gave me this very uh, clear illustration uh, when I was driving one day. Now, I have to confess that I have a bit of a heavy foot when I drive. I like to get to some place faster than Google Maps says I will get there. 
And when I drive by a school zone, I know it's for safety reasons and I do slow down, but every time I'm like 30 kilometers an hour. That is so slow. And here's what the Holy Spirit has said to me. Shayla, perhaps you should slow down to 30 kilometers an hour because you notice. You notice the kids in that elementary school or that high school, and might you pray for them as you drive by slowly? And now I do. I pray for those resilient disciples that are in high school today, sharing their faith, loving Jesus, staying true to him in a world that makes it really complicated for them. Now I pray that many kids in their grades will come to know Jesus because I slow down enough to notice the school zone that I'm in. And as we have done some research around this next generation, Gen Z, which is in high school and in university and just starting into the job market, there's been some interesting research that has been very helpful for us and I hope will encourage you today. This first stat is interesting. The majority of non-Christian Gen Z, 53%, admit to having unanswered questions about faith. 53% of this demographic in our nation has unanswered questions. This is awesome. We can help our friends that are younger than us. We can be parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles to actually engage with young people about unanswered questions about faith. This other stat is also interesting. Do you know that 49% of non-churchgoers in this age group want to know if Christianity is good? That's what they want to know. Only 24% want to know if, if Christianity is true. It's a very different world we live in now that goodness has to lead, not truth. Now, that's not to say truth isn't important. We know it's very important. But what they want to hear is, is it good? And so you and I are living witnesses to the goodness of Jesus. How you treat people in the grocery store, how you live your life is a witness to goodness. So keep being a good witness to Jesus out in the world. And in our most recent research with Gen Z through Open Generation with Barna, we asked Canadian teens, which of the following do you believe about Jesus? We gave them five positive statements and five negative statements. And we had teenagers right across the country answer them. This is the most interesting stat. 45% of Canadian teens said none of the above. They don't have positive things about Jesus or negative. They just don't have an opinion. Do you know what a great opportunity this is for us in our day to reach this next generation? They know nothing. I have talked to youth group leaders who will say, I've got kids that have been invited to my youth group that they don't know who Jesus is. They've never heard him other than a swear word. Now, this provides such a great opportunity, and there's so many more stats I could share with you, but one thing I did want to tell you about is Gen Alpha, not named by me, is coming up right behind, and Gen Alpha is kids that are born between 2010 and 2024, so some of them are still coming. And this age group is the age group that's grown up with screens right in front of them. This age group is the age group we should all be thinking about, the future leaders of our churches. And we are going to have a webinar that we want to invite you to uh, on November 22nd. So if you're a grandparent or a parent, you know, we've got a QR code here. Come join us. It's not about Alpha. It's only about Gen Alpha. We want you to come and learn all about them so you know, what does that mean for our church? What does that mean for my family? What does it mean for the kids that I'm teaching in my school? Uh, we want you to become educated about it so that you can see the opportunity before us. Gen Alpha is coming up and we want to serve you in that. So we need to change our approach and how we share our faith. And here's how. We enter the Spirit's work of loving people by looking to how Jesus does it. So I want to give you five ways that Jesus does it. One, he prays. What does your prayer life look like? Is prayer the foundation? Are you talking to Jesus first before you talk to your friend, or do you talk to your friend first about Jesus and then pray? We should always talk to Jesus first about our friend before we talk to them about him. 
And so love prays and pray to join him and ask God to have eyes to see and ears to hear what he is doing. Love prays. The second thing Jesus does is he pays attention. Are you listening to God and noticing where he's leading as you approach someone? Are you like Jesus who says, I only do what I see the Father doing? I have started to pray uh, because I travel so much and I'm not always in my neighborhood with my, my friends there locally. I just pray, Lord, I'm available for you whenever you want to use me. And so I've asked him to open up my eyes to notice. And I was on a plane just uh, two weeks ago and I had flown from Vancouver to Toronto and then I was uh, flying from Toronto to Halifax. And beside me was sitting a woman and I'd put on my noise canceling headset, minding my own business, and she was shifting around a lot on the seat. And I finally just pulled off my noise canceling headset and I said, are you okay? And she said, I don't know what happened, but..." when I was on the flight from Vancouver to Toronto, I really hurt my hip. Something's happened. I have jabbing pain down my leg, up my back, and it's all coming from my hip. And so she was reaching into her purse to get out some Tylenol and take that. And I looked at her, and I'm telling you, I've not done this before in, on a plane. And I just looked at her and said, I know this is going to sound really weird, but may I pray for you for healing? And she looks at me and she said, oh, are, do you practice Reiki healing? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm a Christian actually, and I love to pray for people for healing, and would you like that? She kind of looks at me strangely. It is weird, right? We're on a plane. And she says, okay. And I said, would you be okay if I prayed for you out loud? And she said, okay. And then she said, the pain is right here. And I said, would you like me to lay my hands on your hip and pray for healing? She said, yeah, that would be great. So I just put my hands on her hip. And I just pray a simple prayer. I said, Father, you love this woman. And she's in a great deal of pain and you know it. And I pray, come Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, would you please bring her healing? Amen. And then I awkwardly put on my headset immediately because, you know, it's just weird. A few minutes later, she taps me on the shoulder and she says, excuse me? And I said, yes. And she said, I just want you to know that when you had your hands on my hips, I had a huge amount of heat in my left hip. And the pain is subsiding. Now, yeah, it is amazing what God can do. But here's the crazy part. This is what I said. Oh, well, you did take Tylenol. Like, aren't we all like that? Sometimes we have great faith to pray for healing, and then we say, oh, here's the excuse. And she said, oh. And then I just put my noise-canceling headset back on. As we're landing, I, we're putting everything away, and she says to me, I just want you to know I have no more pain in my hip. And I just looked at her, and I said, the Father really loves you. And I just left it at that, because it's an inbreaking of the kingdom. It's that unveiling. It's that thinner layer coming between me and someone else because the Holy Spirit's at work. And so God is calling us to pay attention. He's also calling us to listen. And it's a major shift for the next generation. They want to be listened to. They actually want all of us who are older to earn the right to be heard. And we earn the right by listening to them, by being curious, by asking them great questions. And because they want to know Jesus is good, we are a witness to the good goodness of Jesus in them. And so it's a new way to have a conversation for many of us that are used to talking at people, and instead God's inviting us to listen to people. And we know this, and it was written about in a book called Jesus is the Question. Do you know that through the four Gospels, Jesus asks 307 questions and only directly answers eight. I don't know about you, but I actually prefer to be the talker. And God is teaching me to be the listener and to be more like Jesus. So love listens deeply. And then the fourth thing Jesus does is he seeks. He seeks Philip, the woman at the well, Zacchaeus, me, you. We all know he was seeking us before we sought him. And then fifth, he invites. He says, come and see. The first invitation out of Jesus' mouth in John 1 is come and see. 
And then Philip says to a skeptical Nathaniel, come and see in John chapter 1, verse 46. And then in John chapter 4, we see the woman at the well says, come and see a man. Love invites. What does it mean for you, this Christmas season that we're coming up to, to say, come and see? Come to a Christmas service. Come to our come and see event the first Sunday of the month. Come and see. It's an easy invitation. Our role is to not push the message out. It's to join him in what he's already doing. So will you join him again? For most of us, it means slowing down from our hectic life while also recognizing the urgency of the moment that people are lost and despairing. They need to know that there is someone who can bring beauty from their ashes, who brings hope out of despair, and we know that person is Jesus. And so we recognize there's an urgency to meet the chronic need in our world, but we also recognize we have to slow down and walk at the pace of grace with the Holy Spirit, paying attention when he says, speak now. Paying attention when he says, invite now. Paying attention when he says, this was your list, here's my list. Join me in my list, not your list. And being brave and courageous and having to say to the Lord, sometimes I'm really fearful about inviting my friends. Sometimes I'm kind of embarrassed that will this be okay for them. But the Lord is with us, and he longs for people to come into relationship with him. So the most effective thing we can do to share our faith is to grow in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit is ongoing. You know if you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. But every day you can say, come Holy Spirit, fill me again and again and again to make me more like Jesus. And so that's what I do in the mornings. I lay in bed. Before I get out of the bed, I put my hands up and I say, come Holy Spirit, fill me with everything I need for today. And may I join you in what you're doing around me. And as I've prayed that, I have found myself in crazy situations that I never would have anticipated, like this woman on the plane, where the Lord is inviting me into participation with the great evangelistic work of the Holy Spirit. So may I challenge you for one action in your week, might you try this week, lying in bed and praying, come Holy Spirit, may I join you in what you're doing. And then have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying at work, at school, in your home, in your neighborhood, where you volunteer, in your book club. Where might the Holy Spirit this week be inviting you to join him in a conversation he's already having with another person? And so if the most important thing we can do is learn to listen to the Holy Spirit, then why don't we do that now? And I'm going to invite you to stand and at the campuses or if you're in home online, I'm going to invite you to stand as well. So would everybody like to stand? And what we're going to do in a moment is I'm going to invite you to put your hands out. And it's sort of a physical posture that says to the Lord, I'm ready, speak to me. It's the opposite of this, which is kind of God, I dare you. It's this is saying, okay, Holy Spirit, I want to know. What do you want me to pay attention to? What do you want me to know? And for some of you here, it's your first week at church, or perhaps you're just exploring who Jesus is. And in this moment, you may just want to say, Jesus, if you're real, would you just show me today? Would you just make yourself real to me today? And then for everyone else, let's just ask the Holy Spirit, who should I be talking to? Who should I be listening to? Who should I be inviting and so I'm going to pray, come Holy Spirit, we're going to have our hands open, and it's our posture to say, Lord, whomever you tell me, I will, I will listen. And I'm going to ask him to give you a picture of a person or the name of a person, just one. And don't be like me who wants to edit and say, next, please. That one's too hard. Instead, just be available and trust the Lord. So let's pray, come Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, you who are here, we pray now. For those of us wanting to share our faith with those around us, I pray for each man and woman here that you would give them a picture of the person that you want them to participate in their faith journey. Or maybe it's a name, come Holy Spirit.
And maybe you're here today and your prayer is, Jesus, be real to me. If you're real, come and reveal yourself to me. Come, Holy Spirit. May we be faithful hope givers to a world in need. Come, Lord Jesus. And if you're here and you're just asking great questions, last week Pastor Henry preached on why believe in God. I just want to encourage you to listen to that. Father, in this position of prayer with our hands open, we pray from Acts 1-8 that we would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us. So come, Holy Spirit, that we may be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we pray, Father, may we be your witnesses in our neighborhoods, in Calgary, in Alberta, in Canada, and to the ends of the earth. Come, Lord Jesus, and do it in us. And now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.